So good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the first ever finals of the Ryerson Law Practice Program Access to Justice Innovation Challenge. Big round of applause for all the finalists. Now this is an exciting conclusion to the first ever law practice program training portion. Congratulations to all the candidates here for the hard work you've been doing. And part of the hard work we had you do in each of the 64 candidate law firms you were divided into, everyone supported by a practicing lawyer, we asked you all to develop a proposal, a pitch, to find out a way to design, deliver, construct some law-related service or information faster, cheaper, more effectively. Everybody in the system of justice is dedicated to perfection, to getting the result right, to ensuring the process is everything that we want it to be. And we can all say with confidence that our system of justice is second to none. But true to who we are, we're always looking to improve it, to ensure that any injustice is righted, to ensure that those who don't have access to the full measure and protection of the law have it. And that's why so many involved in our system of justice are dedicated to improving access. There are committees and groups at the national stage, at the provincial stage. The government of Ontario has taken a leading role for many years. And you, as future members of the profession in Ontario, have an extremely important role to make to ensure that we achieve the goal. The type of justice for every Ontarian that we would want for ourselves. So 64 firms developed pitches. A judging panel of three exercised their skill, their ability, and their opinion, <laughs> and whittled that down to seven. And I want to introduce that judging panel now so that you will know who to complain to if you weren't one of the seven. <laughs> First of all, the director of our program, Jean Alexandris. <clears throat> the newly appointed director of the Legal Innovation Zone at Ryerson, another first, Hirsch Perlis. <clears throat> and I can't see the third member of the panel, so that person does not need any introduction. Before I introduce, before I introduce our esteemed panel of judges and tell you how this is going to work, I want to again introduce, welcome, and thank the president of Ryerson University, Sheldon Levy. So 64 comes to seven, and we have a fabulous panel of judges to decide the winner. A fabulous panel of judges, and I would like them all to stand up as I call their names and introduce them. Actually, I'll stand up now and turn around, and I will introduce you all. <clears throat> Somewhat out of order, the Attorney General for the Province of Ontario, the Honorable Madeleine Mayer. <clears throat> The Treasurer of the Law Society of Upper Canada, Janet Miner. <clears throat> A leading practitioner in collaborative approaches, in alternate dispute resolution approaches to family disputes, and somebody you've already seen by course and webinar, Judith Hutter. <clears throat> and the reason the reason for the Spaghetti Tower channel, uh, Challenge, the head, the head of programming at the Digital Media Zone, Michael Carter. 
Thank you very much, judges. You're going to have a tough job to do. Thank you. It, Michael tells me that the uh, tower, spaghetti tower challenge on day one of this program was, and it's appending certification by Guinness, the biggest spaghetti tower challenge by lawyers in the world. <laughs> if you properly define the category, you can come up with the answer you want, something that every good lawyer knows very well. So here's how it works. We've got seven firms. We're going to call the first one up. They've been arranged very strategically in numerical order. We're going to call each one up. They're going to have five minutes for the pitch and five minutes for questions. Timing will be kept, and we will rigorously cut them off, just like you sometimes get cut off in court if you're over your time. <clears throat> and then we'll go to the second one. At the conclusion, at the conclusion, we're going to have everybody come up for some pictures. We're going to take the judges out to, to conduct their deliberations and make their uh, final decision. We're going to ask you to remain while the judges are out because that's when the People's Choice Award will be decided. And there's an app that you need to download or otherwise uh, access. <clears throat> and then we're all going to go upstairs where the prize of significance will be awarded to the winner by the Chief Justice of the Province of Ontario, who is coming for the awards presentation. <clears throat> so, that is all the introduction. So now I'm going to start with the fun part, the part that you all want, and call down firm number six, our first group of finalists. <laughs> Joshua Takuna, S.M. Kareem, Zoma Akbona, Malik Suleiman, the program is called the New Court Challenges Program. Take it away. Thank you, Chris. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we're very, very glad to be here. Uh, my name is Joshua Dakuna. Zoma Agbana. My name is SM Karim. My name is Malik Suleiman. And we're just waiting for our panel. Oh, there we go. Wonderful. Okay. So our pitch is the new Core Challenges program, as Chris mentioned. Uh, as many of you in the audience know, and I'm sure everyone on this esteemed panel, we had a Core Challenges program that was funded by the federal government, but it lost funding due to cutbacks recently. And we felt that Canadians would be willing to take on uh, this financial burden if they knew how important the cases were. So, our idea was to start a web-based grassroots campaign for cases that advance the following causes. Aboriginal claims, disability advocacy, sex and sexual orientation issues, race and ethnicity. Now, this is a visual representation of our online hub. When Chris read our uh, proposal, he said that this was goodwill funding. And yes, it is goodwill funding, but in a myriad of different ways. Yes, we are asking people to donate their money, but we're also asking lawyers, advocacy groups, professionals, and concerned citizens to donate their time, expertise, and efforts. We plan on using a transparent docketing system in which the primary lawyer's hours will be docketed and available on the website, along with any hours spent by the additional attorneys or the experts, and any money that the individual people donate or organizations donate will also be available on the site, so everyone will know where the money is going. And then in terms of our actual matrix and how things will work, an individual has a claim of discrimination, they bring it to a lawyer. Now, either the individual, the lawyer, or a third party representative representative can then bring the claim to our attention, in which case we will then take over in terms of advertising it. So we'll seek to get funding, crowdfunding from anyone who's available, also organizations, get the money and help the, advance the cause. To make our new Core Challenges program compatible with the fast-moving technology-driven world, we have planned to use the following e-tools. 
Facebook and Twitter to keep the followers updated about the development of the cases. YouTube to take the advantage of reaching people by presenting short videos. And we will use the internet and smartphone applications for undertaking almost all our activities, such as raising donations, interacting with resources by video conferences, networking with different professionals, and for having web meeting with clients. To be more specific, we will develop applications for Android and Apple operating system so that it comes handy when people will want to get updates, donate money, or to simply contact with the program. Our program is innovative in many ways. It provides a common meeting place for lawyers, professionals, concerned citizens, and all interest groups to advance the cause. We are also proposing an innovative method of funding the cases through web-based funding system. And this is also a great opportunity and innovative way for lawyers in particular fields to network with other expertise in the province. In addition to this, we hope that cases which our organization supports will break a new field in the area of human rights and it represents innovation in access to justice. Thank you. And that's your pitch. Thank you. Okay, I have a, a question on the dreaded hourly rate. So you are going to pay lawyers from crowdfunding, which is a great idea, but how, are you gonna put any control on hourly rates? Or um, I mean, it just seems to me that that could, one lawyer's hourly rate at 600 could zap up all your money. I, yes, I suppose I didn't explain this clearly enough. We thought the lawyers would donate their time as well. And in exchange for putting in hours, uh, they'd get CPD uh, professional hours in exchange for their hours. So that was uh, motivation. the motivation for them to do it, along oh. with the high profile of the case, because it would obviously be very beneficial for them on a public front. Only the primary lawyer will be getting paid in terms of the work that they're actually doing, but all the other attorneys will be donating their time because they're advancing a major cause and they get their name on it, too. And the primary lawyer could donate if he wanted to as well. Exactly. <laughs> So in your chronology, you're going to have the lawyer establish himself first before you go forward. Have you considered what might happen if you think there's a, a really valid case to be brought, but you're not too sure about the lawyer who says he's going to, or he or she is going to lead it? Are you going to have criteria, uh, or are you just going to leave it uh, randomly? Well, we didn't really plan on that exactly, but we do have... Uh, an actual set of indicia for accepting cases, uh, if you guys peruse through. Um, yes. yeah. I noticed the cases. I was yes. more concerned about the strategy because uh, mm -hmm. how much time it gets spent on a case gets into how much it costs, gets into how long it takes to get to court. So if you're interested in access and funding on a, a scale that, that uh, is a bit uncertain, I think. I just wondered if you were going to need more controls over selection of lawyer or some kind of monitoring as it goes along. Well, I think we'd want any lawyer who's interested in helping to be able to do so, but it would be advantageous if we had lawyers who had experience in the area be the ones who are leading it. But again, if the, litig if the litigant goes to a specific lawyer, we're not going to tell them, you know, it's that lawyer, but we'll definitely try and get the lawyers who have experience involved so that the fund does, or the cause does get where it needs to go. You, you might want to have some kind of benchmarking as you go along mm -hmm. to make sure that it's proceeding in a, a, a useful or efficient way. Exactly. That's great. Thank you. That's a exactly. suggestion, great, not yeah. a question. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's a great suggestion. I have a platform question because effectively it's a uh, crowdfunding uh, program for lawyers or uh, just causes. Um, so the platform itself, generally if you look at Indigo, Indiegogo, they charge anywhere between 10 to 13% of the total monies uh, received. So is your uh, company or is your group going to set up the platform and make money off of the money raised or are you just proposing this new process that 
some other party was going to manage. Well, Kareem sort of handled this because he was talking, well, you yeah. can explain. We tried Actually, both. Uh, we set the Indiegogo just as a precedent, and so that we can make our pitch clear. And uh, I'm, I'm, I can get like where you're coming from, about the 10 to 13 percent. We don't want our money to go because each one percent of the money is very important. So probably we'll, we will make some uh, forum uh, so that we can reduce the cost of um, Okay, to, so, yeah. so the operating costs themselves will yeah. also be pro bono. Hopefully, Hopefully. or <laughs> if Indiegogo charges the 13%, perhaps we can take the money raised from our contributors and try and even that out. And maybe we can even negotiate with Indiegogo yeah. and okay. get it for free, who knows? <laughs> okay. Your donation, uh, what will be the advantage uh, to these uh, to these firm? Are you uh, giving them uh, a tax receipt for charitable uh, donation? No. <laughs> well, we thought of a, ch a tax receipt for the uh, people who actually donate the money, but donating CPD, we really didn't uh, plan on that. But that is oh, an excellent point. Perhaps that could be arranged as well. Yeah. We'll talk to the Minister of Finance. <laughs> <laughs> so firm numbers. We have one last question. I can't say good. Now there's time for you. Okay. Uh, I just wondered what kind of business case you're looking at. Uh, have you projected how much money you're likely to get, how much a case is likely to cost, especially if it went to the Supreme Court of Canada? Uh, how, how, how the time it's going to take to collect the money? Do you have any background for that? Um, unfortunately, what we have right now is an actual, there's an actual case in the works that's sort of like this. Uh, there's a young man named Deepan Budlakoti, and he's actually fighting a citizenship issue. And he's using Indiegogo to s sort of try and uh, gain money for his cause. And his lawyers try to partner with Amnesty International. Now, he's running out of funds very quickly, and Indiegogo hasn't been able to raise enough for him to pay off his legal bills, and we figured that this could be maybe a starting point, and if we could figure out a place where people could meet up together, and maybe we could generate some sort of social inertia to help it move forward. Thank you very much. Big round of applause for firm number six. Thank you. Thank you. So we do the extremely important technical turnaround. Uh, the second presentation, and we'll introduce the members in two seconds, is from firm number 17. Firm number 17 has a proposal called LegalShepherd.ca, No Job is Too Small. And firm 17, come on down, is Amandeep Dulit, Valeri Kulkoff, Heather Jean Pierce-Griven, and Christina Wakwa. Come on, folks. Good evening. We are firm 17. My name is Val Kulkoff. Good evening. My name is Heather Jean Pierce-Griven. Hi, I'm Christina Wadwa. Good evening. My name is Amandeep. All right. We want to begin our presentation with a quote from a great American president. Change is the law of life, and those who look only to the past or present are certain to miss the future. Not that long ago, going to the library was the only way to find legal information. As of today, a number of quality websites provide legal information not only to lawyers, but also for the general public. Many of these websites were created in response to the rise of self-represented litigants. There is a feedback effect. The more help these websites provide to self-represented litigants, the more people will choose to represent themselves. Recognizing the fundamental changes in the society, a task force of the Law Society of BC produced a report in 2008 that stated, our present civil justice system and model for delivery of legal services was refined in the industrial age. A lawyer is no longer the gatekeeper or intermediary between the layman and legal information. 
the legal profession must learn how to adapt in order to keep pace with the public's demands and expectations for how information-based services are delivered. In 2006, the Chief Justice of Canada used the word epidemic in reference to the number of self-represented litigants in a Canadian judicial system. In 2007, the Chief Justice of Canada noted that unrepresented litigants impose a burden on courts and work their own special forms of injustice. This brings us to the pain point, um, which was also recognized in the recent National Study of Self-Represented Litigants in 2008, which was uh, sponsored by Law Foundations of Ontario, BC, and Alberta. The report emphasized many self-represented litigants described a fruitless search for a lawyer who would just help them with reviewing their documents, checking their forms, or coming with them to a hearing or court appearance. Parts of their frustration related to not understanding why a lawyer would not give them some type of reasonable estimate of costs in advance. The Law Society of Upper Canada cleared the way to providing limited legal services with the introduction of rules for limited scope retainers. According to a former Law Society treasurer, limited scope retainers provide a middle ground option between full legal representation and no legal representation. And now, another famous quote. The demand for limited scope fixed price legal services in Ontario is enormous. And that was LPP Firm 17. <laughs> so here are some examples of limited scope legal services that we'll be providing at legalshepherd.ca. We'll be doing proofreading of pleadings, coaching for court appearances, assistance with court form forms, preparation of financial statements, our solution to this pain point is LegalShepherd.ca, a website where self-represented litigants can describe their issue or project and request quotes from lawyers and paralegals. Lawyers and paralegals can then choose to fill the void between high workload periods by taking on these limited projects. Here's how LegalShepherd.ca works, the process. The client creates a matter for bidding, legal practitioners bid on the proposal, and the client selects a bid. Legal practitioners can bid only after they've run a conflict check and the conflict has come back clear. We'll be happy to clarify any issues on that point in the question period. Now, the business form that Legal Shepherd can take is either not-for-profit or non-profit, or it could be a service provided by the Law Society of Upper Canada. Now, in the creation of LegalShepherd.ca, we were mindful of Rule 3.6-7 of the Rules of Professional Conduct, whereby lawyers cannot reward non-lawyers for refer of clients. Does LegalShepherd.ca refer clients to lawyers? This can be a question to Janet Miner. <laughs> <laughs> now, the issues listed on this slide apply both to LegalShepherd.ca and the practice of law in general. These issues include inadequate information from clients, quality assurance, protection of confidential information, and difficult clients. We'll be happy to discuss this further during question period. To summarize our presentation, self-represented litigants are not going away. Limited legal advice is better than no legal advice at all. The demand for limited legal service is enormous. The justice system needs relief. The increased availability of the legal service may work to improve the image of the legal profession in Ontario. And uh, finally, LegalShepherd.ca is the way to provide legal services faster, cheaper, and better, and more efficiently. Thank you. I noticed in your materials, you didn't mention it here, that the clients get to rate the lawyers. Ooh, that always makes us nervous. Um, <laughs> if you read anything, any publication now, uh, the comments afterwards are not favorable to lawyers. So I know you've got, you, you mentioned some uh, ways of controlling that, but perhaps you could just remind me of what that is in terms of 
how they'll be, what, <coughs> what they're going to be able to say. Uh, right. Uh, the report, the reviews will have to be essentially censored by the staff at LegalShepherd.ca, making sure that only appropriate comments are provided to the public, and, and the lawyers will have the right to appeal. Uh, there should be a special committee at LegalShepherd.ca to consider those complaints and make sure that all sides are heard. Uh, this is not the first time that sites face this problem. So there's some considerable body of experience uh, accumulated by other services of the similar nature. But this is somewhat unique, so that has to be specially considered. And that is, uh, it, it is one of those uh, to-do things. So I just want to understand your financial model again. Is it your theory that by having your group be a kind of site for people to obtain services, that they're going to be able to obtain them more quickly or easier? Is that the idea, rather than just going into a paralegal office or a lawyer's office? So it, it, it's faster to access, is that part of it? It's not entirely the quickness, it's also like the bidding process. The, yes, the, I was just going to come to that, but, but so the bidding process, are you assuming that the price is going to go down as opposed to go up? That's because the, people have to that's the idea. bid that's low to get the, exactly, the business. Exactly, and we're going to keep the client's name and all the personal information confidential, uh, anonymous, and it goes to the lawyers, and if they have the time and the resources available, they make a bid. It goes back to the client. If the client is satisfied, yeah. Yeah. we and, proceed. And you're defining whatever the uh, service is quite narrowly, so there's, it, would there, would yeah, there yeah. be a chance of, um, of misunderstanding or confusion that someone thinks they're going to get more than the provider is going to provide? How are you going to deal with that? Uh, the, the very important issue here is uh, to provide uh, just enough information so that lawyers and paralegals can run conflict checks and not reveal too much. Uh -huh. uh, and this is the borderline that has to be very clearly delineated. So once the conflict checks are run, uh, the lawyers and paralegals get access to confidential information, they can study the case, and then they have to provide essentially not only a price estimate, but they have to tell what exactly they're gonna do. Because it will depend on a particular lawyer or paralegal. Some may decide that they need to do more, some may decide that they need to do less. But this description, along with the price, and uh, most, <laughs> very importantly, the lawyer's rating from previous uh, transactions will be the deciding factors for the clients. I'm interested in the rating too. You may be interested in knowing uh, that the Law Society gets uh, numerous complaints about lawyers which are completely without merit. Uh, and particularly in cases that are litigious, and especially uh, litigious ones which involve emotions, like family law, so that people often complain because of other concerns they have, and it gets directed at the council. So how are you going to deal with that? As my colleague mentioned, we will have a monitoring system, because we do know that, as you mentioned, people vote on emotion and we are trying to make sure that the image of the legal profession in Ontario gets a boost rather than decreasing. So we will monitor um, the rating system either by having strict um, boxes where they can just tick, and that could be a control mechanism. Um, if they want to leave a comment, the comment could be then filtered to provide only the necessary information to the next client who wants to review it. So we are conscious as future lawyers that our reputations are on the line. So uh, we will make sure that that system is at year two. Thank, you, ver thank you very much for that. And Firm 17. <laughs> If I make, make just one little comment, this is on the website, so everyone is welcome to go to legalshepherd.ca. Lawyers are always playing for more time. <laughs>